Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. So, this is a big old chunker of a book. It's, um, I guess you would call it, it's, it's non-fiction, fiction combined, historical fiction slash non-fiction. Um, it's based on a true story, which is one of the, like, most famous true crime stories to happen historically in Canada, involving a woman. Um, and Atwood has done her best to take what was known about the case and then she's sort of filled in a few of the gaps. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Sometimes I whisper it over to myself, murderess, murderess. It rustles like a taffeta skirt along the floor. Grace marks, female fiend, femme fatale, or weak and unwilling victim. Around the true story of one of the most enigmatic and notorious women of the nation, Around the true story of one of the most enigmatic and notorious women of the 1840s, Margaret Atwood has created an extraordinary potent tale of sexuality, cruelty, and mystery. So let's check out some tabs. Um, whoever had this before me, I got this from a charity shop, but um, they had un underlined a bunch of stuff in it, not too sure why. Uh, we have a poem here at the start. There are a few poems here and out, uh, here and there throughout it. Um, but I found it interesting that it had filtered the word hell, so it was H, then blank, L, which you get a lot in like older poems, older books. Um, so one of the things it does really well is sets like the um, the tone or whatever by looking at like the social mores of the time. So uh, this is all from Grace Marks' point of view. But I have never sat down on the settee before, as it is for the guests. Mrs. Alderman Parkinson said a lady must never sit in a chair a gentleman has just vacated, though she would not say why. But Mary Whitney said, because you silly goose, it's still warm from his bum, which was a coarse thing to say. So I cannot sit here without thinking of the ladylike bums that have sat on this very settee, all delicate and white, like wobbly soft boiled eggs. And so this is where that quote on the back cover comes from, but I just think it's an interesting little passage. The reason they want to see me is that I am a celebrated murderess, or that is what has been written down. When I first saw it I was surprised because they say celebrated singer and celebrated poetess and celebrated spiritualist and celebrated actress, but what is there to celebrate about murder? All the same, murderess is a strong word to have attached to you. It has a smell to it, that word, musky and oppressive, like dead flowers in a vase. Sometimes at night I whisper it over to myself, murderess, murderess. It rustles like a taffeta skirt across the floor. Murderess is merely brutal. It's like a hammer or a lump of metal. I would rather be a murderess than a murderer if those are the only choices. And um, this is a little note on doctors, but also it kind of references one of the sort of vogues at the time of people thought they could measure people's skulls to figure out if they were evil or not. Where there's a doctor, it's always a bad sign. Even when they are not doing the killing themselves, it means a death is close. And in that way, they are like ravens or crows. But this doctor will not hurt me. The government's wife promised it. All he wants is to measure my head. He is measuring the heads of all the criminals in the penitentiary to see if he can tell from the bumps on their schools what sort of criminals they are, whether they are pickpockets or swindlers or embezzlers or criminal lunatics or murderers. She did not say like you, Grace. And then they could lock those people up before they had a chance to commit any crimes and think how that would improve the world. It's all a bit minority report, that. And um, so the doctor, who basically a doctor comes along to interview Grace and so that's what we sort of see the story through. He's talking to Grace and Grace is telling him her story. And this is a letter um, from his mother. And she says, I know it is not my place to determine your path in life, but I strongly urge that a manufactory would be far preferable, and although the textile mills are not what they were due to the mismanagement of the politicians, who abuse the public trust unmercifully and become worse with every passing year, yet there are many other opportunities at present, and some men have done very well at them, as you hear of new fortunes being made every day, and I am sure you have as much energy and sagacity as they. There is talk of a new sewing machine for use in the home, which would do exceedingly well if it might be cheaply produced. For every woman would wish to own such an item, which would save many hours of monotonous toil and unceasing drudgery, and would also be of great assistance to the poor seamstresses. Could you not invest the small inheritance remaining to you after the sale of your poor father's business in some such admirable but dependable venture? I am certain that a sewing machine would relieve as much human suffering as a hundred lunatic asylums, and possibly a good deal more. Obviously, the sewing machine did take off, although it's fallen out of fashion again a little bit recently. Uh, we get a reference to uh, from this letter from Simon Jordan to my dear Edward. But upon my return, we must arrange to meet and to lift the glass or two together for old lang syne and to talk over past adventures and current prospects. And that was just interesting to me because I just it, I read this like the start of the new year, like January third, I think, or second was when I read that 
quote. So that was it's a nice little thing there. We get this line, which I like, because dipsomaniac is a word for uh, alcoholic, which is one of, one of my favourite words. I fear, however, that my landlord is a dipsomaniac. On the two occasions upon which I have encountered him, he was having difficulty putting on his gloves, or else taking them off. He seemed uncertain which, and gave me a red-eyed glare, as if to demand what the devil I was doing in his house. And so, um, Grace talks about what some of the, like, uh, the wardens say to her. Now, can't you take a bit of fun? I'd welcome it if I was you, says the one. But the only men that's ever going to lay a hand on you for the rest of your life. You're shut up in there like a nun. Come now, confess your longing for a tumble. He was ready enough with that runty little James McDermott before they stretched his crooked neck for him, the murdering bastard. And that's the way, Grace, says the other. Up on your high horse, just like a spotless maiden. No legs on you at all. You're as pure as an angel, you are. In a pig's ear, as if you'd never seen the inside of a man's bedroom in the tavern in Lewiston. We heard about that. Putting on your stays and stockings you was when you was nabbed but i'm glad to see there's still a touch of the old hellfire left they ain't worked it out of you yet i like a bit of spirit in a woman says the one or a whole bottle full says the other gin leads to sin god bless it there's nothing like a little fuel to make the fire burn drunk are the better says the one and out stone cold is the best then you don't have to listen to them there's nothing worse than a squalling whore were you noisy grace says the other did you squeal and moan did you wiggle underneath that swarthy little rat looking at me to see what i'll say Sometimes I say I won't have that kind of talk, which makes them laugh heartily, but as a rule, I say nothing. And then she talks about she does the washing and she says, uh, Miss, M Miss Lydia and Miss Marion between them dirty a lot of washing, although much of it is not what I would call dirty at all. I believe they try things on in the morning and change their minds, and then take the things off and drop them carelessly on the floor and step on them, and then into the wash they must go. She's kind of sick of people's shit, because she's um, lived the life of cleaning up after other people. And um, Simon, he's, he's getting his boarding and um, the landlady asks uh, how the egg was and he, he says, Simon lies, to do otherwise would be unpardonably rude. Delicious, thank you, he says. In reality, the egg had the consistency of the excised tumour a fellow medical student once slipped into his pocket for a joke, both hard and spongy at the same time. It takes a perverse talent to maltreat an egg so completely. And um, Simon is talking about public executions. He said, women should not attend such grisly spectacles. They pose a danger to their refined natures. I mean, nobody should attend public executions because they shouldn't happen, but they no longer do. And so um, Grace is talking about when she first traveled to Canada. Uh, they were on a boat and um, his, her, her mother fell ill. Um, she sent for the doctor, but the doctor did not come and my poor mother was getting worse by the hour. By this time she could scarcely speak and what she did say made no sense at all. Mrs. Phelan said it was a shame and they would treat a cow better and she said the best way to get the doctor was to say it might be the typhus or else the cholera as there was nothing on earth they were more afraid of on board a ship. And so I did say that and the doctor came straight away. But unfortunately her, her mother passed away. She's kind of haunted by this, this sight of her mother being thrown overboard for her, her body to be buried at sea. And um, so she's getting into her first job working at a house and she goes, then Mrs. Honey hesitated, as if adding up sums in her head, and then she asked to look at my hands. Perhaps she wished to see if they were the hands of a person who had been working hard, but she needn't have bothered her head, as they were as red and rough as could be desired, and she appeared satisfied. You would have thought she was trading a horse. I was surprised she did not ask to look at my teeth, but I suppose if you pay out wages, then you want to get a good return on them. Interviews have changed since those times, and uh, so she makes friends with a fellow, like, servant, I guess you would call them, called Mary Whitney. Mary said I might be very young and as ignorant as an egg, but I was bright as a new penny, and the difference between stupid and ignorant was that ignorant could learn. Yeah, very fair. Unfortunately, Mary... Well, Mary's nice to her, but she teases her a bit, so we get... Mary said I had to wash my hair as well, and though it was true that washing it too much would take all the strength out of your body, and she had known a girl who had faded away and died from too much hair washing, still it needed to be done every three or four months. And she looked at my head and said at least I did not have any lice, but if any appeared I would need sulfur and turpentine put on, and she had had this done once and smelled like rotten eggs for days afterwards. And she thinks about how uh, a widow is a respectable thing to be if old and poor, but not otherwise, which is quite strange when you come to consider it. Yeah, and I want to read out this little excerpt here. Um, so this is when Grace gets her first period and um, Mary helps her out. Mary said, you are a woman now, which made me cry again. But she put her arms around me and comforted me better than my own mother could have done, for she was always too busy or tired or ill. Then she lent me her red flannel petticoat until I could get one of my own and showed me how to fold and pin the cloths and said that some called it Eve's curse but she thought that was stupid and the real curse of Eve was having to put up with the nonsense of Adam who as soon as there was any trouble blamed it all on her. 
She also said that if the pain got too bad, she would get me some willow bark to chew, and that would help. And she would heat a brick for me on the kitchen stove and wrap it in a towel for the ache. And I was very grateful to her, for she was indeed a good and kind friend. And then she sat me down and combed out my hair, which was gentle and soothing. And she said, Grace, you will be a beauty. Soon you will turn the men's heads. The worst ones are the gentlemen, who think they're entitled to anything they want. And when you go out to the privy at night, they're drunk then, they lie in wait for you, and then it is snatch and grab. There's no reasoning with them, and if, and if you must, you should give them a kick between the legs where they'll feel it. And it's always better to lock your door and to use the chamber pot. But any kind of man will try the same, and they'll start promising things. They'll say they will do whatever you want. But you must be very careful what you ask, and you must never do anything for them until they have performed what they promise. And if there's a ring, there must be a parson to go with it. I asked her innocently, why was that? And she said it was because men were liars by nature and would say anything to get what they wanted of you. And then they would think better of it and be off on the next boat. And now I saw that we were in the same story as the one Aunt Pauline used to tell about my mother. And I nodded wisely and said that she was right, although still not altogether certain what she meant. And she gave me a hug and said I was a good girl. And so uh, Simon, the doctor, he's thinking to himself um, about basically being a surgeon. A surgeon was a sculptor of flesh. He should be able to slice into a human body as deliberately and delicately as if carving a cameo. A cold hand and a steady eye were what was required. Those who felt too deeply for the patient's suffering were the ones in whose fingers the knife slipped. The afflicted did not need your compassion but your skill. All very well, thinks Simon, but men and women are not statues, not lifeless like marble, although they often become so in the hospital surgery after a harrowing period of noisy and leaky distress. He'd quickly discovered at Guy's that he was not fond of blood. But he'd learned some worthwhile lessons nonetheless. How easily people die for one, how frequently for another. And how cunningly spirit and body are knit together. A slip of the knife and you create an idiot. If this is so, why not the reverse? Could you sew and snip and patch together a genius? What mysteries remain to be revealed in the nervous system? That web of structures both material and ethereal. That network of threads that runs throughout the body, composed of a thousand Ariadne's clues, all leading to the brain. That shadowy central den where the human bones lie scattered and the monsters lurk. The angels also, he reminds himself. Also the angels. Uh, there's a reference in this to the saying, fine words butter no parsnips which is another one of those where it's just that weird um, sort of serendipity, um, synchronicity it's called, because I'd just seen that be a question on a quiz show. And so Dr. Jordan is asking uh, Grace um, what her duties involved, and um, so she goes, oh, the usual, sir, I perform my duties. You will forgive me, says Dr. Jordan, of what did those duties consist? I look at him. He is wearing a yellow cravat with small white squares. He is not making a joke. He really does not know. Men such as him do not have to clean up the messes they make, but we have to clean up our own messes and theirs into the bargain. In that way they are like children, they do not have to think ahead or worry about the consequences of what they do. But it is not their fault, it is only how they are brought up. Very little has changed there. So um, she continues along here, I reached the privy and emptied the slot pail and so forth. And so forth, Grace, asks Dr. Jordan. I look at him, really, if he does not know what you do in a privy, there is no hope for him. What I did was, I hoisted my skirts and sat down above the buzzing flies, on the same seat everyone in the house sat on. Lady or lady's maid, they both piss and it smells the same, and not like lilacs neither, as Mary Whitney used to say. What was in there for wiping was an old copy of the Godie's Ladies book. I always looked at the pictures before using them. Most were of the latest fashions, but some were of duchesses from England and high society ladies in New York and the like. You should never let your picture be in a magazine or newspaper if you can help it, as you never know what ends your face may be made to serve by others once it has got out of your control. Uh, interesting. Doesn't really happen anymore. And so she's talking to like her master, Mr. Kinnear. Um, he tells her about the Apocrypha. He says, then he said the Apocrypha was a book where they put all the stories from biblical times that they decided should not go into the Bible. I was most astounded to hear this and I said, who decided? because I'd always thought that the Bible was written by God, as it was called the Word of God, and everyone termed it so. And he smiled and said that though perhaps God wrote it, it was men who wrote it down, which was a little different. But those men were said to have been inspired, which meant that God had spoken to them and told them what to do. So by this point, um, Mary Whitney is no longer with us. Um, I don't want to say why, you'll have to find out for yourself. I guess I should preface that with a trigger warning for backstreet abortions. And they're talking, she's talking about churning, uh, churning some milk into butter here. She goes, as the, ch as the churn was the kind that was worked by a foot pedal, I was able to sit in a chair while doing it and attend to some of the mending at the same time. 
Some people have churns that are worked by a dog which is penned up in a cage and made to run on a treadmill with a hot coal under its tail, but I consider this to be cruel. While I was sitting there waiting for the butter to come and sewing a button onto one of Mr Kinnear's shirts, Mr Kinnear himself came past me on his way to the stable. I made to get up, but he told me to remain where I was, as he would rather have good butter than a curtsy. Yeah, fair. I mean, I'm vegan, so... But I would rather have good, spreadable butter alternative than a curtsy. Let me get some good old misogyny here. Uh, oh ho, says the one. That's what I like. A little high spirits in a woman. A little fire. They say it comes with the redness of the hair. But is it red where it most counts, says the other. A fire in a treetop is no use at all. It must be in a fireplace to cast enough heat in a little cook stove. You know why God made women with skirts? It's so that they can be pulled up over their heads and tied at the top. That way you don't get so much noise out of them. I hate a screeching slut. Women should be born without mouths on them. The only thing of use in them is below the waist. I mean, if you got, even if you're going to take that misogynist line, there is some good from the mouth as well. And um, basically, Jeremiah the peddler wants to take her away because he senses something bad's going to happen. Um, and she asks if he's going to marry her. And he says, what would be the need of that? Marriage never did any good as far as I can see. For if the two are of a mind to keep together, they will. And if not, then one of them will run off. And that's the long and short of it. Which I think is true, but then I'm kind of anti-marriage. It's a lot of money to spend on a public decoration of love. And we get this again. Um, this is a Mary Whitney quote. Mary was great. Mary Whitney used to say that no man wanted a skeleton. They liked something to take a hold of. Some at the front and some at the back. And the more asked, the better. But I did not repeat this to Nancy. Probably for the best that she didn't repeat that. And just here, a nice little show of her uh, religious kind of leanings. Uh, I should point out that basically the plot by this point, she's left where she worked first. Um, and she's working at the place where the murder was eventually committed. And um, one of the other servants, McDermott, he says he's going to kill Nancy and, uh, I can't remember his name, but the older dude. Um, and Grace is kind of scared. She, she, she like tries to tell them, but they don't take her seriously. And she doesn't know what to do. So that's how she kind of ends up becoming an accessory to murder. Of course, this is all from Grace's own narrative. So she might be lying. It's up to us to kind of decide. But yeah. When I came back out, there was a strange light in the kitchen, as if there was a film of silver over everything, like frost only smoother, like water running thinly down over flat stones. And then my eyes were opened, and I knew it was because God had come into the house, and this was the silver that covered heaven. God had come in because God is everywhere. You can't keep him out. He is part of everything there is. So how could you ever build a wall or four walls or a door or a shut window that you could not walk right through as if it was just air? And so this is from Simon's point of view, the doctor, um, and he's thinking about Grace's personality, and he says, Grace's will is of the negative female variety. She can deny and reject much more easily than she can affirm or accept. Somewhere within herself, he's seen it, if only for a moment, that conscious, even cunning look in the corner of her eye. She knows she's concealing something from him. As she stitches away at her sewing, outwardly calm as a marble Madonna, she is all the while exerting her passive, stubborn strength against him. A prison does not only lock its inmates inside, it keeps all others out. Her strongest prison is of her own construction. And a line here, again, a very misogynist line, but, um, you know, it's, I guess it's true. A whore must feign desire and then pleasure, whether she feels them or not. Such pretenses are what she's paid for. A cheap whore is cheap not because she's ugly or old, but because she's a bad actress. And uh, Simon talks to Grace's lawyer, and basically um, he took it and uh, his boss said, Well, my lad, here it is. Everyone knows you'll lose because there's no doubt as to their guilt. But it will be the style in which you lose that will count. There is graceless losing and there is elegant losing. And then um, back at the asylum, there's a new matron on duty. They're becoming stricter again. If there are too many marks against you, they cut off your hair. It's, like, it's very biblical, like uh, Samson and Delilah, except with the sexes reversed, I guess. The great line here. The sun was shining and every stone of the wall seemed as clear as glass and lighted up like a lamp. It was like passing through the gates of hell and into paradise. I do believe the two are located closer together than most people think. And just this final thing, so towards the end, Grace is basically exonerated and, and let out of jail. Um, and we get this little bit right at the end, which I thought was a very nice little ending. Uh, now here is another thing I have told no one. I just had my 45th birthday when I was let out of the penitentiary, and in less than a month I will be 46. And I thought it was well past the time for childbearing. But unless I am much mistaken, I am now three months gone. Either that or it is the change of life. It is hard to believe, but there has been one miracle in my life already, so why should I be surprised if there is another one? 
Such things are told of in the Bible, and perhaps God has taken it into his mind to make up a little for all I was put through at a younger age. But then it might as easily be a tumour such as killed my poor mother at last, for although there is a heaviness, I've had no sickness in the mornings. It is strange to know you carry within yourself either a life or a death, but not to know which one. Though all could be resolved by consulting a doctor, I am most reluctant to take such a step, so I suppose time alone must tell. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to highlight for you from Alias Grace. I thought it was really beautifully written, um, very interesting how it mixes together, as I say, historical fact with a bit of, not necessarily fiction, but outwards own kind of conjectures. Um, and there is also this element, almost of the supernatural to this, which I didn't think really worked well in it, because again, when you've got crime, crime and supernatural don't go well together. Stephen King keeps doing this as well. It just doesn't work, at least for me as a reader. Maybe it does for other people. Um, but yeah, there's some really good stuff in this. It reminded me of In Cold Blood, The Moonstone, and The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher as well. Cat just scared the crap out of me. Uh, washing machines going off downstairs as well. Overall, really did enjoy this book. 4.5 out of 5. Strong recommend. And this now means I've read two Margaret Atwood books, and between the two of them, they average 4.75 out of 5. So, probably on, on course to become a new favourite writer. I need to read some more of her stuff. So there we have it, that's what I made of Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.